to a great start. I want to welcome you here to our service of witness to the resurrection for a woman who has filled our hearts with love, fondness, and inspiration. And simply just as a reminder as we get going, to be here, to really be present, and to be here for why it is that we are here, which is to celebrate Lillian Docks, her gifts, her spirit, her courage, her humor, her legacy, and our memories of them. 
So just fully be here. You are the community of people and you viewing from wherever you are viewing from or listening. You are the community of people who love Lillian and who she loved. And that is a great thing. I want to do a few housekeeping things at the beginning. Uh, the first is to say to the people viewing at home that we are in the midst of switching over our old streaming system to the new one. And as you can tell from the slight boom which I'm hearing, which I'll try to adjust in just a moment, not everything is functioning perfectly yet. This is going to be a service where uh, one of Lillian's favorite expressions, we're having an adventure. Uh, might just uh, apply to several gestures throughout the service. If you have uh, phonage and devices with you, please mute those if, uh, if you would. During the service, as, uh, as Donnelly and Mary Lynn uh, and I have planned this, there was a desire expressed that we not simply jump steeple or style from thing to thing to thing to thing, but there might be times or moments during the service where we simply want to pause to let something sink in to be with that, much as the ancient Hebrews in their worship but sometimes in sort of technical term that scholars best guess at is uh, it simply means pause, take a breath. And that word in the Hebrew is salah. It even sounds calming. So there might be a few moments in the service where we observe salah for a moment or two. We just wanted to let you know that that was going to be happening. One of the things that I only realized this morning and didn't have time to do anything about is that while you in the sanctuary won't notice anything different, you at home, when it comes time to sing the hymns, we hope you'll be doing so, but you may not be hearing a lot of singing. You'll be hearing a lot of organ, I think, uh, but not a lot of singing at home. So again, don't let that weird you out. And you might have to turn your volume down and turn your volume up from time to time during the service. This is the maiden flight of this system. I think that should be it. So we're going to begin with one of the passages that Lillian's family picked out for, especially today. It's from Paul's letter to the church in Philippi. Philippians, as we would refer to that. Oh, one other thing. Ever efficient section, I think, has your little piece of my controller up here. You, most of you, of course, know what this is. We have not been using them all year. We've gone to a different form of uh, the bulletin that has all the content. But the hymns, we will sing the hymns from this bulletin. Those of you at home have these in your worship materials, uh, and also will be, they will have for reference, the words to the Apostles' Creed and the Lord's Prayer, which we will also be using uh, in the service. So a reading from Philippians, chapter 4, from the 4th through the ninth verses. Rejoice, Paul says, in the Lord always. And again I will say it, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, Whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. 
I invite you to stand or to stay seated as, uh, as you are able as we sing hymn number 526 for all the saints. Eternal God, we bless you for the great company of all those who have kept the faith, finished their race, and who now rest from their labor. We praise you for those dear to us whom we name in our hearts before you. And especially we thank you for Lily, whom you have now received into your presence. Help us to believe where we have not seen, trusting you to lead us through our years and bring us at last with all your saints into the joy of your home, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you.
A reading from the Hebrew Scriptures, the Tanakh, from the book of Ecclesiastes, some know as Koheleth, which is what our Hebrew sisters and brothers refer to this book as. For everything there is a season, and a time for every matter under heaven. There is a time to be born, and a time to die. There is a time to plant, and a time to pluck up what is planted. A time to kill, and a time to heal. A time to break down, and a time to build up. A time to weep, and a time to laugh. A time to mourn, and a time to dance. A time to throw away stones, and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace, and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to seek and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. What gain have the workers from their toil? I have seen the business that God has given to everyone to be busy with. God has made everything suitable for its time. Moreover, God has put a sense of past and future into their hands, yet they cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. I know that there is nothing better for them than to be happy and enjoy themselves as long as they live. Moreover, it is God's gift that all should eat and drink and take pleasure in all their toil. I know that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it, nor anything taken from it. God has done this so that all should stand in awe before the Lord. That which is already has been, and that which is to be already is, and God seeks out what has gone by. A reading from Psalms. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful hearts, joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good, and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations.
Salah. A reading from the Gospel according to John, the 14th chapter, verses 1 through 7. These powerful words you might know don't occur as a preliminary to boil down to a bumper sticker or a speaking engagement by Jesus. This was the last time that he was to be with his disciples on earth. He's running headlong into the uh, gargantuan that is the Roman Empire and the Jewish temple authorities, and trouble is brewing. He knows it, his disciples know it, and his disciples know that he knows it. These are Jesus' words taking into account the fear, the sorrow, the worry that is in the room. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, and the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also, and from now on you do know him, and have seen him. I'm in a unique position today when it comes to my sermon. The first, this is the first time I've had an actual manuscript and not an iPad or a computer screen in front of me for a year and a half. But mostly I'm in the unique position today of having had most of my sermon written for me for today by one of Lillian's daughters, Donnelly Docks. It's not that Donnelly foisted uh, her remembrances and reflections on me or exercised any pressure for me to take them. It's just that they're so darn good, I wanted to make full use of them. I found myself thinking, you know, it would take so much work on my part to try to say things about Lillian in a way that was even remotely as good as what Donnelly has written. And then besides that, to come up with a different way of saying it that didn't sound to her like I was just paraphrasing everything she'd written. So I decided just to go ahead and abundantly quote from and enjoy along with all of you what you have written, Donnelly. And Donnelly has came up a couple of times when you and Mary Lynn and I were speaking this week. I definitely encourage you to explore your gifts. In the way we spoke about. It was no accident that you titled your remembrance as a sermon. I'll speak with you about posting your complete sermon and remembrances, if you would so allow, on the website once we get that up and booted again. But in the meantime, each of you should pester her for a copy. Or we can handle that through the church if you wish. But it's that good, and you'll want a copy. There's a story I want to tell first, though. It's not directly connected to the marvelous imagery from John's Gospel that we just read, but it does speak to the goodness and to the faithfulness of God. It's a story that my people here in this church, and Lillian most certainly among them, have heard often over the years, and I in turn heard this story many years ago and continue to deeply appreciate it. It was about a Sunday school teacher who was telling in a very dramatic way the Old Testament story of Abraham's attempt to sacrifice his son Isaac. Now the story is suspenseful enough, uh, 
on its own merits, but you add to that a little dramatic flair, and it's the type of story that drags you to the edge of your seat. So as the teacher raised a pretend knife, which is in Abraham's hand, to slay the imaginary Isaac bound tightly upon the cold, hard rock, one little girl suddenly jumped up and said, stop, stop, I don't want to hear anymore. And a young friend pulled her by the hem of her shirt and tugged her back into her seat. He said, it's all right, she said. This is a God story. It turns out okay in the end. This is a God story, and it turns out okay in the end. For Lillian, whose journey is now complete, for all who have gone on before, and for each one of us as well. Our lives are marked by two profound passages, Donnelly writes. God's gift of spirit to us in birth and in death, the gift of our spirits to God. God reveals God's self in these passages, she goes on. The revelation comes not in the majesty and grandeur of our cathedrals, music, poetry, and rituals, but in the humility and miracle of our own flesh. The Christian journey is one of coming into being, living an embodied life in time, and returning to God the fullness of that being fullness of that being. And not on these remembrances, and I wouldn't be surprised, Mary Lynn, if your comments or feedback found their way into this occasionally, uh, but their remembrances of their mother's life and their moments together are rich and they are embodied in their earthiness, their humor, their poignancy, and their translucence. I was reminded of something that author and Presbyterian minister Frederick Beekner once wrote. I am an Acropolis, he said. Fathers and mothers, brothers and cousins and uncles, teachers, lovers, friends, all these invisibles manifest themselves in my visibleness. Their voices speak in me, and I catch myself sometimes speaking in their voices. Donna Lee remembers her mother's voice, one time in particular, her mother singing, This is my father's world, while building a snowman for her then small daughters on the front lawn of the family home. It's always been one of my favorite hymns as well. It goes on, and to my listening ears, all nature sings and roundly brings the music of the spheres. I rest me in the thought of rocks and trees of skies and seas, his hands, the wonders, wrought. In stories which must have been told them by Lillian or one of her sisters, her daughters learned of Lillian's growing up with her twin sister, Irene, and younger sister, Joan, on the Marquardt farm in Richmondville, working in hay fields, hand milking the cows before school, and tending to the family's gardens, and how all of this instilled in Lillian industriousness and practicality. Now, not only Donna Lee and Mary, but probably the whole family and circle of friends as well, were kept up to date through the years on Lillian's many passions and activities as they developed. Attending SUNY Oneonta, where she and her twin sister Irene were often confused with one another teaching fourth graders, obtaining a sporty red convertible, which must have been quite the show around town at one point, and a fixture in her early professional years. She developed a passion for Brooks Chicken. There was the making a home of the house that she and Thurston settled into in Oneonta, with its hardwood floors and its English garden, and together raising their two girls. She loved singing in the First Presbyterian Church Choir. She loved participating as an ordained elder on session, the church's governing board, helping on the flower committee and assisting with the annual rummage sale. Summers found her nurturing her love of music and supporting the arts by ushering a glimmer glass opera. An avid learner as well as a teacher, she took CCAL classes 
engaged in Bible study with a curious and open mind, and met regularly with her book group and her sewing group. Numerous Oneonta organizations found Lillian in their midst, including the Garden Club, Friends of Huntington Library, Fox Auxiliary, the Master Gardener Program, PEO, that marvelous organization, Saturday's Bread and the Lord's Table, and she loved weather, especially thunderstorms. Mary and I uh, suspect she is Sorry, I'm still reading what Don Lee has written. Mary and I suspect she is now on Heaven's Weather Committee. <laughs> Hence the spectacular wind, rain, clouds, snow, light, and shadows these last two days, and the rainbow stretching from First Presbyterian Church to Neowa Park, two places associated deeply with Lillian, with Mom. I quoted one of Lillian's favorite phrases earlier, which, as Donnelly points out in her remembrances, was usually applied when things were going awry. We're having an adventure, Lillian would say. And she cultivated her own adventurous trip spirit on trips to Alaska, following up on her fascination with the Iditarod. Did not know that. She went to the Holy Land with a tour group, to Jamaica and England and continental Europe, to Thailand and Bermuda for family celebrations, to many states in the continental U.S. to visit family and natural wonders. Sometimes those groups overlap, you know. Uh, and these visits went on from California's giant redwoods to the rugged coasts of Maine, and you were in such high spirits when you wrote that that I fully thought you were going to burst forth in full-on Pete Seeger mode and continue to the Gulf Stream waters. This land was made for you and me. There were numerous bus excursions to Saratoga and New York City for arts events and concerts. And I'll tell you that I myself was fortunate enough to experience Lillian in this mode. A good decade or more ago now, Lillian, along with another vibrant and energetic member of this congregation at that time, Barbara Means and myself, drove down to New York City to take in a traveling exhibit from Israel. This exhibit included an actual huge cut stone which had been part of the temple in ancient Jerusalem, a part of its walls. Afterwards, we enjoyed a lovely meal at the Oyster Bar inside Grand Central Terminal, and then had fun kidding around with a couple of New York City policemen. Although I was unsuccessful in my attempt to get them to handcuff and pretend to be arresting Barbara and Lillian, for some reason they were reluctant to have a picture taken of that. And the conversation with those two ladies up and back from the city, as you would imagine, was delightful. Lillian enjoyed sewing and was quite good at it. And who knows how many dozens or hundreds of mittens she knitted over the years for our Christmas season mitten tree ministry. I got a kick out of reading how Lillian once sewed a sport jacket for Thurston, repurposed from the drapes she had made for his original office at Hartwick College. And I wondered if Lillian had been inspired by Gone with the Wind with Scarlet's own repurposing for garments. This next part is all Donnelly as well. Beneath Lillian's activity and industriousness ran a deep appreciation for the gift of life, with its ups and downs, joys and sorrows, diamonds and rust expressed in her frequent reminder, it's part of living. She saw details in everyday life most people missed. On a walk down Main Street, she might prune dead petunia blooms from the city's planters and pause to admire a single flower rooted in a sidewalk crack. Animals and young children found kinship in Lillian's gentleness. On one of her walks, seeing a man scolding his dog, she stopped to pet the animal, calming not only the dog, but its human as well. Lillian sensed beauty in simple things, spring snowdrops, delicate frosts, silent summer dawns, quiet music, and soft kittens. She spoke of coming home weary from teaching to curl up with a blanket on the floor with the family cat, Joyce, 
as a welcome moment of respite from the busyness of daily activity. A vast capacity for love and forgiveness shone through Lillian's being. Never one for undue fuss or excess, she offered succinct wisdom. If it doesn't need to be done, don't worry about it. Live in the present because we can't go back. If something is difficult, do it a few times. And her signature advice, which we would all do well to heed, go to bed early. <laughs> One anecdote conveys Lillian's view of the world. Driving with her daughter, Mary Lynn, the pair came upon a dilapidated house in various states of ill repair, wallowing in neglect. As the car made a sharp turn and the house came into full view, Lillian locked eyes on this troubled abode. She stared at the structure in all its glorious failure, the overgrown weeds, rusty implements peppering the yard, the large fallen tree branch, the two junked cars asleep on the lawn, months worth of garbage bags sitting in a cart awaiting a trip to the dump, peeling paint and sagging walls, and Lillian, taking it all in, did not say what many of us might have. She did not say, what a mess this place is. She did not say, such a disaster. What's wrong with the owner of that house? She did not say, can't he be bothered to take care of his property? She said, without judgment or commentary, that's a nice chimney. <laughs> That's a nice chimney. Lillian saw what was upright, what was solid, what was good, and let the rest be. We should all be so fortunate to see beauty everywhere, in nature as well as in our own humanness. To remember Lillian today is to reflect on the gift of life itself as the most profound expression of God's love and the deepest mystery we can know. May the memory of Lillian's birth, life lived, and passage home continue to show us God's love in the lives we ourselves live and take us into that mystery with reverence and humility. As she would often say, that's the way it is. To remember Lillian is to rejoice, for God is indeed near. Thank you, Donna the profound expression of God's love and the deepest mystery we can know. I love that sentence. And I got a huge kick, too, out of something that you and Mary Lynn shared with me this week when we met. Talking about your mom, and you told me that she once said, I feel sorry for God. Why, you asked her. Well, I've read the news, she replied. And indeed, I think God and the blessed angels have long ago worn out their anthropomorphized necks from shaking them back and forth so often that the long, drawn-out adolescence, and a juvenile adolescence at that, of all God's children on this sparkling blue orb. But as Donna Lee and Jay, as Mary Lynn and Fred, Irene and Bill, Joan and the cousins and all of us, I'm sure I've had occasion to observe. While she did not go in for elaborate theology, she did live her life simply and directly, a soul whose gentleness was ever evident and at home in God's world of ringing nature. Now she takes her passage from this earth and joins in the peace of God, which transcends this world and our human understanding. You know, whatever the actual reality of our anthropomorphized beliefs and visions about the Almighty or the Eternal turn out to be, I believe that one thing that will not prove false in any way are the words and the spirit behind them from John, which we heard earlier. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you? Told you that I go to prepare a place for you. And when I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. 
Lillian is now in that place with Thurston and I suspect one with hardwood floors. She is together as well with her folks Lillian and Martin and friends who have gone on before. And there is warmth and light, there is fun and laughter, there is healing, wholeness, and peace. This life is a God story. It's a God journey. So let us live our lives for the rest of our lives, that when we see Jesus' face, his eyes will be filled not only with love for us, but also with approval and pride. And hopefully, we will so live that when it is our time to go, that Lillian, in catching up with us and hearing all about what we've done and what we've been up to after she has left us, will find more to say in response than just, well, that's a nice chimney. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I invite you to stand or to sit as you choose. We're going and to join in if, again, it is in your tradition or if you would like to join in with us. As we say the Apostles' Creed, which is found in the front of those blue hymnals at the top of page 14, we will say the traditional version together. Please stand as you are able. Let us say what it is that we believe. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. We have some special music here. It is a performance and recording by Mary Lindons.
invite you to join with me in prayer. And as part of this, we'll use our hymnals at the top of page 16 in the front before all the music and say together the words of the Lord's Prayer. And I think we're all aware of the different traditions when they come to one part of this use different words. So whether you say debts and debtors, or sins and those who sin against us, or trespasses and those who trespass against us, I will leave a little pause, a salah in that, to have everyone catch up or wait up, as the case might be. Let us pray. Almighty God, in Jesus Christ you promised many rooms within your house. Give us faith to see beyond touch and sight some sure sign of your kingdom, and where vision fails, to trust your love which never fails. Lift, every, lift heavy sorrow and give us good hope in Jesus, so we may bravely walk our earthly way and look forward to glad reunion in the life to come through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And now, in the words that our Savior has given us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Before we sing our closing hymn, which is number 473, For the Beauty of the Earth, I wanted just to say a brief word about the close of the service and what follows. After we sing the hymn, I'll give a brief prayer, and there will then be three chimes, which Kim will ring from the handbell. Immediately after that, I'll say another very quick prayer known as a blessing, and I will then head down the aisle as our quartet has made their way to the back of the sanctuary and will sing for us the sevenfold Amen. Once that magnificent work has echoed its last uh, overtone, Kim will play the postlude, and during, during the postlude, as that plays, ushers from the funeral home will come and make their way down to the front row and will dismiss first the family, and then they will make their way back row by row. Now we're aware that this is a favorite piece and Kim does a great job playing it, so if you would prefer to wait in the sanctuary or even in the back of, well, let's not gather the back of the sanctuary. So either to wait in your seat while it finishes playing, you may do so, or as the ushers reach your room, you may go ahead and exit. You'll still be able to hear it somewhat in the social hall, but I wanted to let you know that's how we'll do things there. Now, when it comes to the social hall, masking is the word. Social distancing is the word. You may sit, of course, with your pods or family members. And if you've gotten both vaccines, the CDC is telling us, you're probably free to sit at that table and to have something to eat. And we've tried to pick things that would be non-invasive in the environment. So eat, sip coffee, sip hot tea, if you like. But I would ask you this also, if you, if you have not completed your vaccines, or if your comfort level is simply not at the, that point, please respect yourself, keep your mask on, and take from one of the attendants on our membership fellowship committee, a cup or a container of the mixed nuts. We have someone else who with gloved hands and tongs will be serving cookies and such onto napkins, take those with you if that makes you more comfortable. Have them later on and think gratefully of Lillian during that time. 
Having said that, I invite you to stand if you are able as we sing hymn number 473, For the Beauty of the Earth. shall return. This you ordained when you created a saying, you are of the earth, and to the earth we shall return. And all of us go down to the wholesome, life-giving, moist earth. We draw life and sustain from it during our days here, that even at the grave we make our song, Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Give rest, O Christ, to your servant with all your saints, where there is neither pain nor sorrow nor sighing, but life everlasting. Receive Lillian now into the arms of your mercy, into the blessed rest of everlasting peace, and into the glorious company of the saints in light. Holy God, by your creative power you gave us life. And in your redeeming love, you have given us new life in Christ. We commend Lillian to your merciful care. In the faith of Christ our Lord, who died and rose again to save us, and who now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever.
Peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God, and of God's Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father of the Son and Holy Spirit, remain with you always.